Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Space This Week, your Monday summary rocket rundown of all the latest news regarding SpaceX's Starship, all the launches we saw happen over the past seven days, all the launches we're expecting to see over the upcoming seven days, and, of course, all the best and most interesting historic spaceflight anniversaries that will be taking place over the course of this week. Now, these videos are news videos, so unsurprisingly, they are best enjoyed on their day of upload. So do make sure you're subscribed to the channel if you're not already, and ring that bell so that you get notified of these videos as soon as they go live so that the news you're about to receive is as up-to-date and relevant as possible. But intros and salutations aside, let's move on to our first segment, all the latest and greatest news regarding SpaceX's Starship development. <laughs> Right now, when it comes to the documentation of Starship development, there are now sort of two things we're following. We're following the construction of the gigantic orbital launch integration tower and launch platform, as well as the Starship vehicles themselves. Starting with the former, the tower terrifically towers over the entire Boca Chica complex as SpaceX continues to assemble the gigantic obelisk that will serve as a launch tower in the conventional sense, and also as the final point in the Starship assembly line as on top of the structure will be a crane system that will lift a Starship vehicle on top of a super heavy booster which will be resting on the launch platform itself the little white structure here which is being constructed right now as well over the past few weeks we've seen the vertical extensions get added to the main support legs and SpaceX have now begun adding cross beams to connect the pillars together overall everything is really starting to take shape the tower currently stands at six segments tall the latest piece was added just yesterday Two Two more segments are left, with segment number 7 being much the same as the previous sections, and segment number 8 being the final cap piece that will top the whole structure off. We did see some mysterious components arrive at the Boca Chica site over the last week as well. We're currently not quite sure what these could be, but they may be the legs of a new test stand, or components for the integration tower's crane, booster catch slash grabber system, or something else entirely. What are your thoughts? Let me know down below. Of course, the integration tower isn't the only tower being built at Starbase. There's also the High Bay, which until very recently was the tallest structure at the site. The top of this building will eventually contain a bar with all glass windows, providing excellent views of the Boca Chica waterfront and, of course, the Starbase itself. Elon tweeted a view from the roof not too long ago to give us some idea of what this view will look like. I personally can't wait to have a whiskey or 12 up there when it's open. Below the bar is, of course, the rocket assembly space itself, where BN2, I mean BN2.1, I mean BN3, no, I mean booster 2, actually, no, I mean BN2, no, I mean um, the first prototype booster, I think is its name now. Either way, the latest prototype super heavy booster is being assembled. We'd originally assumed that this would be the rocket that would carry SN20 on Starship's first orbital flight test, and BN1 and BN2.1 were the test tanks that would help steer SpaceX's construction. But Elon Musk has now confirmed that this will also be a Pathfind vehicle and will be used for testing over at Test Stand A. What tests will be conducted are yet to be confirmed. I think we can safely assume that it'll definitely undergo cryoproofing, and we may even see a Raptor or two get attached to it for static fire and possibly even hop attempts like we saw with SN5 and 6, and as we were originally expecting to see with BN. Too. I'm sure we'll hear more about this as more news and, I guess, Elon tweets <laughs> unfold. Starship serial number 16 remains in a bit of a limbo next to SN15. This vehicle was, of course, the backup to SN15, which was rendered a bit redundant when SN15 performed all of its objectives perfectly. Elon has hinted that SpaceX might use it as a hypersonic flight test vehicle, which is generally speeds of Mach 5 or above. But Elon tweets aren't really concrete confirmation of anything at this point, so we'll have to wait and see what happens to this prototype. Does Boca Chica Beach need a new lighthouse? SN16 could easily have some LEDs glued to its nose cone and it could be moved to the shoreline. It's just a thought. Anyway, I'm happy to leave my coverage of Starship development there. At this point, I generally segue along to talking about everything else that happened last week in the world of spaceflight last week. But before we roll that transition, I do have to shamelessly quickly ask you to like the video down below if you're enjoying the ride so far. Really, really does help channels stay alive and all that. And it's always very much appreciated. Anyway... Last week, we saw a crew EVA from the International Space Station performed by astronauts Shane Kimbrough and Thomas Pesquet. This followed their EVA on the 16th of June, on which they attached the new rollout solar arrays to the P6 truss. 
Unfortunately, this EVA was delayed due to a number of issues with Kimbro's spacesuit, and so the array had to be left folded up. Last week, on the 20th of June, they were able to head back out there and finish the job. The array rolled out over the course of about 10 minutes and is the first of six new rollout solar arrays that will be fitted to the International Space Station to boost the station's electrical charge generation by 120 kilowatts during the day. We also had three rocket launches last week, two suborbital and one orbital. The orbital launch was on the 25th of June and was a Soyuz 2.1b that launched from the Plesetsk Cosmodrome. On board was a Pion NKS Signals Intelligence satellite, which the rocket successfully placed into low Earth orbit. I do love a good Soyuz launch, perhaps because we're always guaranteed lots of amazing shots of the launch from the ground. Wow, look at that thing go. <laughs> the two suborbital launches were both sounding rockets. The first was on the 23rd of June, which was a Brazilian booster sounding vehicle rocket, which launched from the Estrange Space Center in Sweden, carrying a joint German and American boundary layer transition flight experiment to hypersonic speeds and to an apogee of 281 kilometers. The second sounding rocket launch was a Terrier Improved Orion, which launched from the Wallops Flight Facility on the 25th of June, carrying an educational payload for the Colorado Space Grand Consortium. And that's it for last week. We were hoping for a couple more orbital launches, but they were sadly delayed to this week, which means that we can talk about them now. The first launch this week will be one that was delayed from last week. It's a Falcon 9, which will now launch on Tuesday the 29th of June. This is SpaceX's Transporter 2 mission and will carry lots of small satellites to low Earth orbit in what will be SpaceX's second dedicated smallsat rideshare mission. On board will be about 79 small sats from various customers across the globe. Among them is the QMR KWT, an education satellite, which will be the first ever satellite from Kuwait. The next launch will take place on the 29th as well and will be a Soyuz 2.1A launching Progress MS-17 from the Baikonur Cosmodrome. Progress is the designation for Russian resupply missions to the International Space Station and this will be the 169th flight of a Progress spacecraft. Around 3 hours and 20 minutes after the launch, Progress MS-17 will automatically dock to the Russian orbital segment of the station where it will remain until late 2021. The next launch of the week will be another one that was delayed from last week. It'll be on the 30th of June and will be the second operational launch of Virgin Orbit's Launcher 1, which is an air-launched rocket that's deployed from the wing of a modified Boeing 747. This flight, dubbed Tubular Bells Part 1, named after the song Tubular Bells, which was the first record produced by Virgin Records, will carry four CubeSats to low Earth orbit. Two of them are for technology demonstration, one from the Netherlands and one from America, and the other two are two Polish Stork Earth observation satellites. Air launches are definitely very fun to watch, given just how different they are from what we normally see, and so hopefully this mission succeeds and Virgin Orbit can capture some footage that's possibly even better than the great shots we got of the last Launcher 1 mission. The final launch of the week will be another Soyuz mission, this time a Soyuz 2.1b, which will launch on the 1st of July from the Vostokny Cosmodrome, carrying the next 36 satellites for the OneWeb Communication Satellite Network, bringing the total number of operational satellites in the constellation to 248. And that's all the launches we're hoping to see this week, and so now it's time for our final segment to cover, all the most interesting spaceflight anniversaries that are set to take place over the next seven days. The first anniversary of the week takes place on the 29th of June in 1971. It was on this day that the crew of the Soyuz 11 spacecraft were tragically killed after a faulty valve led to depressurization of the spacecraft. To this day, the three cosmonauts, Georgi Dobrovolsky, Vladislav Volkov and Viktor Patsayev, remain the only humans to have ever died in space. The Soyuz 11 mission up to the valve failure was a successful one. It was the first successful mission to the world first ever space station, the Salyut 1, where the crew lived and worked for 22 days. They then reboarded the Soyuz, where it then undocked and retrofired a few hours later. The work compartment and the service module were routinely jettisoned from the re-entry module, and at this moment, radio contact came to a sudden and abrupt end. The hatch between the command module and the work compartment had an imperfect seal, which meant that after the craft separated, the air supply of the spacecraft could escape. The fate of the cosmonauts wasn't known about until after the landing, when recovery crews opened the hatch to find the three men dead in their suits, having died of pulmonary embolisms due to the lack of air supply. 
They were given a large state funeral and were buried in the Kremlin Wall Necropolis at Red Square, near to the remains of Yuri Gagarin. After the tragedy, the Soyuz spacecraft underwent extensive modification and was changed to only carry two cosmonauts to allow extra room for the crew to wear Sokol spacesuits during launch and landing, a lightweight pressure suit intended for emergency use, an updated version of which remains in use to this day. The next anniversary is on the 1st of July, when, in 2004, the Cassini Huygens began its Saturn orbital insertion, after which it would become the first ever spacecraft to orbit Saturn. The Cassini-Huygens mission was one of legendary proportions, teaching us a plethora of information about Saturn and its moons, one of the landmark moments of the mission being when the Huygens lander landed on the moon Titan, which to date is the furthest from Earth a human-made object has ever landed, and it even took photos, which look, in a way, kind of terrestrial, despite being from a completely different world. The Cassini mission ended in 2017 in dramatic fashion. The probe was deorbited and sent on a collision course into Saturn. During the re-entry, it sent back as much data as it could before it succumbed to the atmospheric forces, and the analysis of the returned data will continue for many years to come. I mostly mention this aspect of the mission because I will take any opportunity I can to showcase the amazing swan song footage created by NASA for the event. Our next anniversary is on the 2nd of July in 1985, when on this day an Ariane 1 rocket launched the Giotto space probe. This was a probe developed by the European Space Agency to fly by and study Halley's Comet, which it successfully approached in March of 1985 and in doing so became the first spacecraft to make close-up observations of a comet. Despite being hit by some small particles, one hit destroying its multicolour camera, the probe was able to take lots of photographs of the comet's nucleus at closest approach, as well as gather a great sum of scientific data. It was then flown by Earth to put it on a flyby of another comet, this time Comet Griggs Cellarup, which it came within about 200 kilometers of in July 1992. It was then switched off and remains deactivated. Over its life, it made a number of big firsts. The probe made the closest approach to Halley's Comet. It was the first spacecraft to provide detailed pictures of a comet's nucleus. It was the first spacecraft to fly by two comets, and it was the first spacecraft to perform an Earth gravity assist, and the first probe to be reactivated from hibernation mode. On the 3rd of July, we have a big one. Literally, the biggest explosion in the history of rocketry occurred on this day in 1969 when a Soviet N-1 rocket exploded and subsequently destroyed its launch pad. We covered an N-1 failure in last week's episode of Space This Week, but this week's was an even bigger firework display. The N-1 rocket as a concept failed for many reasons, but the chief reason why the Soviet Saturn V never succeeded was because it was ultimately rushed, underfunded, began development four years after the Saturn V, and was set back immensely after its chief designer, Sergei Korolev, died in 1966. Each of the four attempts to launch the massive rocket, the first stage of which remains the most powerful rocket stage ever launched, resulted in failure, and today's explosion remains not only the biggest explosion of a rocket ever, but also one of the largest artificial non-nuclear explosions in human history. It did start off kind of okay, the rocket lifted off into the night sky, and things looked good for a few moments. As soon as the rocket cleared the tower, there was a flash of light, and debris could be seen falling from the bottom of the first stage. The engines therefore instantly shut down, aside from one, causing the gargantuan rocket to fall out of the sky, slamming itself and all 2,300 tons of explosive propellant down onto the launch pad, triggering a massive blast and shockwave that hurled debris as far as 10 kilometers from the launch pad. One silver lining of the launch was that the launch escape system for the unmanned test vehicle had worked and pulled the capsule to safety. Sometimes the small victories are what count. On July the 4th in 1997, the NASA Pathfinder space probe landed on the surface of Mars. This contained the Sojourner rover, the first rover ever landed on the surface of another planet. The Pathfinder lander conducted a plethora of studies on the Martian soil and of course took some great photographs in the process. The little rover conducted rock and soil analysis and took some photos of its own too. 
In addition to its scientific data gathering, the mission also served as a proof of concept for various technologies, such as an airbag system to absorb the high-speed impact forces that parachute descents on Mars result in, due to the thin atmosphere providing little drag for a parachute. It validated many of the systems that would eventually be used for the subsequent Spirit and Opportunity rovers, which would be launched in 2003. The Mars Pathfinder landing was the final anniversary I wanted to discuss this week, which therefore brings an end to this week's history segment. What a week it has been! It was great to hear that the first rollout solar array has been successfully installed on the P-6 truss of the International Space Station, and while it's a shame we didn't get to see the Launcher 1 mission, I do love me a good air-launched vehicle, at least we now have something else to look forward to this week instead. Starship, as always, remains a fascinating project to watch as we get closer and closer to that all-important first orbital flight test. Exciting times definitely lie ahead, folks. Anyway, as you can see on screen, there is now a scrolling list of Patreons. They are my Patreon supporters who support me on Patreon, unsurprisingly. You can join their ranks by clicking the Patreon button on screen or via the description link. You can also join the channel by clicking the join button below the video and get some cool emojis to spam and you get a badge next to your name. There's two other videos on screen. They're both of my channel, both of which were chosen by YouTube just for you. So hopefully you enjoy them. Guys, thank you so much for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed it and I will see you in the next one.